Our guest, Renee Nicholson, author of Fierce and Delicate, Essays on Dance and Illness, was a professional ballerina. How does she write about ballet in a way we can all understand? And I think a lot of it is threading in all those sensory details. What do things smell like? What do they feel like? Welcome to Writer's Voices. I'm your host, Monica Hadley, and my mother, Caroline Kilborn, is on hiatus this week but she will be back with us again soon. Our guest today is Renee K. Nicholson. Renee splits her artistic pursuits between writing and dance with scholarship in narrative medicine, and we're certainly going to ask her about that. She is Associate Professor and Director of the Humanities Center at West Virginia University. She was the 2011 Emerging Writer in Residence at Penn State Altoona, 2019 winner of the Outstanding Public Service Award from the Eberly College of Arts and Sciences, and she's got a whole slew of other awards too. Her books include two collections of poetry, and the book that we're talking about today is A Memoir in Essays, Fierce and Delicate, Essays on Dance and Illness. Welcome to Writer's Voices, Renee. Thank you so much for having me. So you started out your professional career as a ballet dancer. Yes, I had trained since I was uh, fairly young. Um, and I'd say uh, formally in, in ballet around age seven. Wow. And so the first part of this book, these essays are largely about your ch- your childhood, youth, adolescence training in ballet. Now, a lot of little girls dream of growing up to be a ballerina. <laughs> yes, for, <laughs> and, sure. <laughs> for sure. And I, I was I, at age seven, that was what I wanted to do for sure. But um, for whatever reason, my parents couldn't take me to ballet lessons and finally when I was like in junior high school and my younger sister wanted to learn ballet they started ballet lessons for both of us but starting when you're like in seventh or eighth grade is kind of embarrassing when you're with all the little (laughs) the second graders you know (laughs) so so I did not stick with it but um, what drew you to that and what kept you going because it doesn't sound like a particularly easy life for a kid. You know, um, it really isn't um, easy. Um, and, and like a lot of things that uh, we give value to, it's when you have to give up and really commit to something that it creates that sense of value in you. Um, I started, I was, uh, you know, My mom was looking for activities for me, uh, you know, and uh, dance has, you know, all sorts of benefits, healthy benefits, you know, exercise and things like that, uh, self-discipline. I was a little klutzy as a child, (laughs) so uh, I'm sure that played into it, too, like wanting to have uh, a better sense of of grace and poise. The funny thing is, I don't know that I'm any less klutzy because of my dance training but if you tell me what steps and what order to do then I do all right but just walking around maybe not so much (laughs) Um, you know I I still had a a tendency to bump into things and all that kind of thing so um, but I I think I was fascinated by you know how ballet worked I was always um interested. I wanted to know why we were doing something. And I would become very enamored that if you practiced enough, you might, you know, if not master the skill, then really learn how to do it. Um, And I think I um, maybe just have one of those personalities where I just like to hone in on something and I can kind of put the blinders up and just really focus. And uh, ballet is um, you know, an art form that rewards that to a certain degree, and, and if you can really focus that, and I'm sure my teacher saw that in me and, and nurtured that as well, so that sort of ability to, to give yourself over to something. And does that work as a writer also? 
I, I definitely think that it does. Um, that same kind of uh, uh, intense concentration, um, you know, I, I, uh, am, I do have a, a side of me that likes to talk to people and interact with people. Uh, and then I also have a need for kind of quiet and solitude. And I think during that quiet and solitude, I like just intensively focusing uh, on words, on language, on, you know, a sentence, uh, you know, I, revision is something that I do a lot of, you know, you write the essay, you take it apart, you put it back together, you write it again, you take it apart, you put it back together. Um, I think that kind of uh, concentrated effort is something that is fairly natural to me um, in terms of, uh, you know, just making the time and space for it. Mm. So let's talk, let's go back to, you know, the childhood experiences. Um, Part of it is being away from home a lot at these intensives in the summertime. (laughs) Oh, yes. (laughs) (laughs) Right of passage for sure. <laughs> wow. And um, you went to some pretty impressive places. You want to tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, you know, at a certain point, you know, with the, the teachers pull you aside and tell you you can do this in the summer. And um, I was relentless on my parents. Let me go. Let me go. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, I have to say they were very supportive and they were not at all pushy. This was not something, you know, that they had chosen for me, uh, but that I kept saying, I want to do this. I want to do this. And, um, you know, one of the places that I got to go uh, was um, uh, Interlochen Arts Academy. And at Interlochen, the interesting thing is you're not just there with dancers. You're there with all sorts of different uh, uh, artistic kids. So, you know, one of my good friends there play viola um, and, uh, you know, other, you know, I, I had friends in musical theater, in um, orchestra, in, you know, uh, fine arts. Uh, I mean, just all across uh, the gamut where, you know, some of the summer intensives that are put on by the schools associated with professional ballet companies, you're just there with other dancers. Um but at Interlochen, you, I kind of uh, opened my mind up to uh, more art forms, and I think that's why that particular experience really stands out to me. Um, it's also in a very remote part of uh, northern Michigan, not the upper peninsula, but in the lower peninsula, you know, but towards the northern northern part of, of the state. And um, I think the isolation there kind of also was like this <laughs> little utopia of uh, young people who were really interested in the arts. And that struck me as, as being very different <laughs> than, you know, everyday life um, in a good way. <laughs> right. And it seems also that some of the others where you were just competing with dancers or you were just with other dancers, you were always in competition with them and it was hard to make friends. Whereas at Interlock and where you had other artists of other forms, you weren't directly competing. So maybe that was also an advantage. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, um, I knew, uh, nothing about viola when I met my friend who played viola. So <laughs> I was just really interested in it. And we had nothing in common. I mean, we, you spend all day at your art, so there's a similar shared experience. But, you know, at the, at the ballet intensives where it was just other dancers, you know, I wanted to make friends, and I, and I did, but it was hard um, because you are always in competition. And you know a certain amount of, of students – aren't going to be asked back or asked, you know, to stay in the year-round programs or asked to do some of the other things. Um, And, you know, this happens, too, um, you know, even with, you know, the yearly auditions for the Nutcracker, your best friend and you are, you know, out there trying to get the same part. Mm. (laughs) Uh, You know, so it's, it's not something that you're not, already expecting when you go away you've kind of already experienced that to a certain degree but 
you know, all of a sudden you're thrust into a situation where everybody um, who's there is good enough to pass a, an audition and everybody who is there probably is at least in the upper echelon of the, you know, the students that dance at their hometown studios um, because they're selected and um, all of a sudden the stakes are higher uh, and that can be hard to manage from a, I'm also a teenager trying to manage normal teenage stuff. <laughs> you know, it's, it sounds similar to like if you go to an elite college and everyone yeah. who's at this college was at the top of their class in high school. And so suddenly okay. somebody's not going to be at the top anymore. And I think that can be hard. Yeah, <laughs> it really is. Really and that's a great analogy. Um, I think that's exactly what happens. Um, and, you know, you don't even mean it to be that way. It's just sort of you, you start following you know, the advice of your teachers and you start going places and those are sort of the rules of engagement when you get there. Um, and I would think at those elite schools, that would be similar. <laughs> now, one of my favorite essays in here was about uh, studying in Russia. Can you tell me how <laughs> that came to be? You know, it's one of those uh, things where you have the opportunity and I begged my parents to go. And of course, you know, this is the 80s and our, <laughs> our feelings about, you know, what was then called the Soviet Union <laughs> uh, were very different. But there were in the late 80s, these opportunities for exchange. And so, you know, I happened to, you know, be able to, to do that. And, you know, it's, it was not very long, but it stands out in my mind because it was very different than anything else that I had done. Um, and I had a teacher who just, you know, said, uh, you know, I, I want to take students there, and she did. Um, many of my teachers had that, that kind of willfulness, <laughs> uh, but she had forged a relationship with, with a Russian teacher. Um, and I think that that speaks to how even how other cultural differences can be so different. There is a shared cultural experience around, uh, you know, ballet and the training of ballet dancers. How old were you? I was 16. <laughs> and, and how long were you? How long were you there? Um, if I remember correctly, and I'm always, I always say that because memory can be a faulty thing, but I want to say in the five to six week range, wow. not you know long enough to feel like I got a snapshot, not long enough to feel like I was uh, you know part of their culture. <laughs> right. Now, was your teacher there with you, or were you really on your own? She was. Yeah, she was there with us. Oh, that's so, good. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, there were lots of rules at that point, and especially, you know, you know, when we think about this moment as a political moment, um, you know, it's the late '80s. Um, you know, the uh, president is saying things like "perestroika" and "glasnost," and these are words that we sort of understand, but really don't. <laughs> um, you know, you you see summits with Mr. Gorbachev and you know as a young person you sort of take it in but it's not the focus of your everyday necessarily and so um, you know prior to this it was always U.S. versus Russia right you'd watch the Olympics or you um, you know hear snippets of newscasts and that you know that was very much our consciousness at that point so when things started to open up it was both exciting but there were all sorts of you know, sort of rules around this too. Like we're gonna tiptoe in. <laughs> and your your room was bugged. Yes, <laughs> this was not unusual. I mean, I, you know, any place that they were gonna have Americans, they were they probably bugged things. And and you know, there were people who've gone there that were you know for various different things, but other dancers who went that you know. Um, having read, you know, their biographies or memoirs, you know, this was kind of like par for the course. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Which, yeah, it's crazy to think now, um, you know, uh, that that would happen. But, you know, there was that idea still of surveillance, like what all, you know, we're going to open this and we're going to talk kind of big about, you know, what we're doing here. But there's still a network. There's still a... Mm, big Brother's on. watching. <laughs> 
Yeah, that's still happening, for yeah. sure. <laughs> You're listening to Writer's Voices, and our guest today is Renee K. Nicholson, author of Fierce and Delicate, Essays on Dance and Illness. So we've been talking about dance, um, but illness is kind of a big part of this, too. Do you want to kind of tell that story? Sure, absolutely. So, um, y- you know... One of the things about being a dancer is you kind of get used to, uh, I'll call them workaday injuries, right? You know, your body is constantly sore. You're always tending to blisters and, you know, uh, pulled muscles and things like that. And um, I started to have issues where my joints were swelling, particularly my knees. And, you know, at first I thought, okay, you know, overuse. <laughs> but then it kind of got to the point where I'm like, this is, this just doesn't feel right. And, um, and you were how old up, at this point? Uh, in my early 20s. Um, <clears throat> yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, not very, not very old. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I think I, you know, can best describe the swelling that was happening is if you took a grapefruit and you halved it and you slipped it under my patella, <laughs> and it was that's how much things would would uh, be inflamed and swell up. And I'm, I'm thinking, you know, this isn't right. Um, and so I, I ended up getting uh, diagnosed uh, with rheumatoid arthritis, and um, you know, this is an autoimmune condition where um, basically your immune system attacks your healthy joint um, uh, tissues. And so, I mean, just completely like out of left field. Um, and autoimmune diseases are often like this. I, I you know, would describe them as very spooky um, because they can just start to manifest. And um, in the case of rheumatoid arthritis, um, what doctors know and what uh, researchers know is that it's something that's, you know, sort of already with you, the, you know, uh, you know the code or whatever the right um, nomenclature is. Um, but usually there's some sort of triggering event and, you know, that can be as simple as, you know, you got the flu <laughs> and it triggered it. And, you know, um, I, what triggered mine, I'm not 100% sure. Um, but you, you're predisposed to it, and uh, it's a blood test. Um, and uh, so all of a sudden, it's like dancing is no longer an option for me. So, you know, I'm, I'm in college, and I'm taking classes, and I'm trying to figure out what next looks like. And um, Because at that know, point, you were to... dancing professionally in a in a company. Mm-hmm. Right, and... and you know, and taking college courses and trying to balance a whole life. Um, and, um, you know, that wasn't going to be sustainable for me with rheumatoid arthritis. I, I really needed to figure out um, what was next. And um, so I, I, I did find writing um, really uh, because of a wonderful writing teacher named Susan Neville. And Susan is an award-winning writer. I didn't know that when I took intro to creative <laughs> writing. <laughs> and, um, so I, um, you know, I had written a, a short story and, had, you know, uh, turned it in. And, and there was a little note, you know, come see me on my office hours. I'm like, oh, this isn't going to be for me. Um, <laughs> <she's> probably- <laughs> that's, that's exactly where my mind went. Um, And I went to her office, and she had all sorts of helpful things that um, we talked about. And and she said, did you like this? And I said, well, yeah, I did. And she's like, do you have a major? And I'm like, not really. (laughs) She's like, do you think this as a major? And I'm like, do you think that I can? And then she, you know, handed me some applications, (laughs) and that was that. Um, And I kind of needed you know, that sort of thing, uh, because, you know, all of a sudden I was on regimens of medications and trying to figure that out um, is an ongoing thing. I mean, just as I, I think I've got it figured out, either something new comes out or in, in, in the early stages, I had a therapy that was working that over time I developed an allergy to. So, oh my. you know, you, yeah, you just, you know, it's a constant monitor and, and adjust. Um, but, 
you know, I, at that point, you know, when I was first diagnosed and for a while, I kind of thought, you know, writing would be a thing maybe I could do and, and dance would be something I did, you know, as a young person. And, um, you know, I, I definitely, um, you know, saw, saw my focus pivot. Um, and for a long time, uh, I didn't write about dance. Uh, I wasn't ready to talk about what had happened. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I really wanted to just explore other things. And I think um, probably at the time that was very healthy for me. Um, and then, you know, I, I, I pursued that and, and I worked for a while, um, worked a lot in sort of, I'll say writing adjacent fields, particularly in like marketing and advertising. I was pretty good at coming up with copy, you know, <laughs> as you do. Uh, um, but at night I would scribble stories and essays and poems and, and I just really couldn't, you know, I, I was always kind of driven to do that. So I, I did end up going back to graduate school for writing. And it was there, you know, after I'd had some time to kind of, just live in, in my new body and my new self, I was like, all right, I just started writing about dance and it was like floodgates opened. <laughs> I was ready to really, you know, talk about that world, talk about uh, me. At first I thought I was going to write fiction because I, I thought, well, you know, I was nowhere close to ever being a famous dancer. <laughs> mm-hmm. and, uh, so I was like, well, Who's going to want to know my story? So I, I you know, would write fictional things. And, and you know, I, I was kind of building a, a way of, of writing about dance when I was doing this. Uh, but I would often get in, in critique, well, this is obviously about you. And I'd always find that funny because, I, you know, we give these characters the ability to do things I could never do well in class. Ah. <laughs> That's just nothing like me, but... Yeah, what I started to understand was maybe, maybe I should, you know, start writing, you know, from, you know, my experience. So I took a nonfiction workshop, and that's where I really started thinking, you know, more about maybe I should be writing about, you know, my lived experience, and maybe it's okay to be you know, a dancer uh, who isn't famous, who's sort of, you know, the workaday dancer. And um, there was a another woman whose name is ironically also Renee, uh, Renee Daoust. And Renee was a dancer in the Martha Graham uh, Modern Dance Company. And she was right. She had written an essay called Graham Crackers about being at the summer intensive um, at the Graham School and I was like, oh, my gosh, look what she's doing. And I was so inspired um, by this piece. It was in uh, the Mid-American Review. And um, I just remember, like, wow, um, like, that's the real deal. And, and maybe I can write about my own experience in a similar way. And um, she had a memoir that came out uh, called Body of a Dancer, which that essay is a part of. And that also really influenced me. Um, as it turns out, um, she and I have gotten to know each other, and we're both former dancers named Renee turned writers, <laughs> and we both love dogs. And I have a giant golden retriever, and she had a tiny little dachshund. <laughs> <laughs> really great. Uh, and that, that's been one of the cool things about the dancing and the writing is – um, you know, I've, I've kind of found a small group of, of folks that were dancers that are writing about dance. And so it's almost like a sub-community <laughs> of the writing community. Um, incredibly kind, incredibly helpful, um, incredibly supportive. Uh, so, uh, you know, that was, you know, one of those things I could never have planned for and was just such a beautiful thing to have happen out of all this. But, you know, for a long time, I kind of stuck to writing other things. And then I started, I really started writing poetry in, in earnest. And, but I always kind of kept my hand in writing this book. Um, and I started it in 2006. And I think I 
finished the last essay probably 2017, 2018. <laughs> <So> <laughs> it's quite a long time. <laughs> um, yeah. But but you know you're covering a lot of a lot of ground here. You know one of the things you you mentioned um, that the other Renee's book was called Body of a Dancer, and of course a dancer's body is everything. Um, it's and and it's very particular kind of what a dancer's body is supposed to look like and and be like <laughs> and work like and like it must be really h- hard as a young person to have p- constantly feel like your body's being critiqued yeah um i'm really glad that you brought that up because it you know there has been for so long such a particular look to a ballet dancer and such an emphasis on on thinness um uh and I'm happy to say that things have started to change, um, maybe not fast enough, but we're just now starting to see the kind of talks about inclusivity on a, you know, on a bigger scale, not just, you know, the thinness and, uh, you know, pure physicality of a dancer, but also, um, you know, addressing issues of race, especially in classical ballet, where, you know, that has been fraught for a long time. And, and I'm glad to see these things being discussed and, and you know, with, you know, folks like Misty Copeland. Um, yeah, I saw her first. perform yeah. in, in New oh. York. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Wonderful. She's, she's amazing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, but as a young person, you internalize this for sure. I mean, my notions were, of beauty were all famous dancers and, you know, I cut out their pictures from Dance Magazine and put them on my wall. I mean, you know, Darcy Kissler and Kelsey Kirkland and uh, Suzanne Farrell. And, you know, um, you know, there's a whole host. I mean, uh, probably all the dancers from New York City Ballet and American Ballet Theater <laughs> as the, you know, that had been featured in Dance Magazine probably went up on my wall at some point. Um, and, and there's a particular... There's a particular look there. I mean, um, you know, long neck and um, oval-shaped head and long limbs and sort of sinewy muscles. And, you know, so much of that you don't have control over because genetics don't work that way. <laughs> you know, when in my one, one uh, like, term of ballet lessons, my I had a French ballet teacher, you know, and this petite little woman living in this little town in Pennsylvania. And she would always tell me to round my elbows. And I, I was ultra skinny, very long neck. I probably had the body of a ballerina, but my elbows were very pointy. And there was just no <laughs> way to round them. <laughs> it was impossible. <laughs> so when I was in high school, I was in track and I, I, uh, tripped over a hurdle on a cinder track and I had a big scar mm-hmm. on my elbow from that and I I would tell my nieces when I was older I was telling the story about this ballet teacher and and tell her tell them that I tried to sand my elbows off and and they and that's what that scar was from <laughs> and they believed me but it was a joke <laughs> But that's the kind of thing, like, that's the kind of information that you get from a teacher, right? Yes, you, yeah. You, like, you know, your teachers are former dancers, and they look so glamorous, and why can't I just look like, you know, yeah. like them? And, I, mean, I, was, I, think- I was all elbows, all knees and elbows, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> well, and... You know, I, you know, round your elbows. I mean, that's such a strange, like, from a language point of view, like, you start thinking of, well, how do you round your elbows? <laughs> yeah. you, know, and, you know, something that, that happened with me is, as I went back and got some training um, on how to be a dance teacher um, and, and got to teach dance for, you know, several years uh, here in West Virginia where I live. And, um, we talked a lot about um, the language and having to really um, be precise with your language when you're teaching young people to dance because around your elbow, <laughs> like, okay, what's the mechanism? How do you actually do that with your body? And, 
you know, I had teachers that were really good with language and I had other teachers that would just basically put your body into the shape they wanted. Mm, yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, and uh, later learning, you know, really coming back to dance um, with that sort of beginner's mindset of, okay, I may know a few things about dancing, but now I need to really understand it inside and out if I want to teach it. And uh, that was, um, it was a very humbling experience, but it was also just a wonderful experience because that kind of early drive that I wanted to understand things, I finally started to understand like how the pieces came together in a really specific kind of way. Um, and so I found myself, you know, in my mid thirties returning to dance again, but in this whole different context. Um, yeah. From that the, when you write about that, it seems like that was very fulfilling for you. Extremely. And I loved, I loved being in those teacher training classes. I, I was there at American Ballet Theater. I did their national training curriculum. Um, they were super intense, but um, really lovely. Uh, I loved uh, getting to know the other teachers. And um, I, I found myself completely absorbed in the process. Um, and, and then uh, working with students. And I've worked with um, mostly students from about age nine up, um, but I've, you know, some of it, some of the teaching I've, I've done is uh, here at West Virginia University where I work, and, um, you know, that was really satisfying. My favorite to teach, and people think I'm nuts, is, is right around, you know, age 12 to 14. Um, I think those are tough years for um, young people in general, um, but that's right around the time when um, young female students, and now some male students as well, uh, start point work. And uh, there's something about that, that, that age and that um, time that just speaks to me, I think, on a pretty essential level. Um, and so that was always really fun for me uh, to do. Um, fortunately and unfortunately, I've, I've taken a new role at the institution, so I don't really get to teach much dance these days, and I do miss it. Um, but I, I also uh, direct the Humanity Center uh, at, here at WVU, and, and that's super fulfilling. So. Sometimes we're we're making these trades, but there are definitely times where I'm now missing teaching teaching dance, um, and I I often feel more longing to teach dance than to go back to dancing myself. And um, oh, I, I, interesting. I, that's yeah. A, <laughs> yeah, and I don't know if that's where I am in life or if I just really. I'm so interested in the, how things work. I mean, um, and to bring it back to writing, I'm, I'm someone who, all right, this paragraph isn't working, so I'm going to take apart, I'm going to take it apart sentence by sentence and try to figure out why it's not working. So I think I, I have that sort of drive in, in both mediums. Um, but when you're when you're teaching dance. Um, you're really problem solving, right? So you're trying to help the dancer understand what they need to absorb as far as technique, and you want them to get it right because teaching it right from the outset is way easier than having to go back and undo, you know, a poor habit or uh, any mistraining. So, um, you know, it's, it's really the clinic and problem solving. <laughs> and, right. You know, how do you articulate this to someone so they can understand and absorb it into their own body, right? Yeah. Um, now, how do you write about ballet in a way that non-dancers can understand? You know, I, I have a couple of readers that are non-dancers that I often will give things to, to see, you know, do you understand this? Do you feel excluded from this? You know, why why or why not? And it's a fine line for me because you can write about dance in a way that you can alienate other dancers, which I desperately don't want to do. And then you can write only towards people who understand dance and then 
um, the non-dancers are, are, so, are left out. So you're really trying to find a sweet spot between them. Uh, and I think a lot of it is, you know, threading in all those sensory details. What do things smell like? What do they feel like? You know, um, you know, what are, you know, can you can you use all five senses? Um, describing the look of ballet can be particularly challenging because it's, you know, it's not replicated in sort of an everyday way. Like we walk places, <laughs> but when you even walking as a dancer is way different than the way that we would walk from point A to point B. Uh, so I, I think. It's it's definitely a challenge. Um, I don't know that I always get it right, uh, but I do try to to get the work out there to several different early readers and and definitely people who are not of the dance world. You know. Uh, right, right. You're listening to Writers' Voices with Monica and our guest Renee K. Nicholson, author of Fierce and Delicate: Essays on Dance and Illness. Now, Renee, all dancers have to face eventually that their bodies won't do what what they used to be able to do. And part of, I think, the admiration that the general, you know, that the audience has for dancers is what you can do with your bodies and and how lovely it is. And it's like you sit, we sit there in the audience and think, oh, I wish, wish I could do that. You know, isn't that amazing? But most of us don't wish for all the years of hard work that it took to get to that point to be able to do that. Sure. But you were having, you had to face this inevitable decline of the ability of your body to do what you wanted to do far sooner than others. And I found that very, the way that you wrote about that to be very um touching and also very emotional because I'm at an age where I'm facing that every day. (laughs) (laughs) I'm well into, uh, there's this, this kind of lost, this feeling of lost youth that you had to deal with so much earlier than most people. And, and you write about it in such a real way. Um, was it painful for you to, to kind of have to relive that and, and write about that? Yeah, that's a great question. And first, let me say, like, the inevitabilities of our bodies <laughs> is such a resonant thing. Um, you know, I, I've, I've experienced it and seen it in, in many different ways. And one of the funniest things was uh, that, uh, people will often tell me, I like it, you know, oh, I can definitely see like your dance training. And I feel like I've just watched it all go away. <laughs> a friend of mine, a wonderful writer named uh, Penny Zhang once said, well, uh, I could tell you were a dancer because you were the only person who sat perfectly erect during a writing workshop. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, the posture was sort of ingrained in me. So it's like, I didn't even know I did that. So, um, but to get to your question about, about, you know, reliving, I think because I've given myself the time and space not to write about it immediately and to let myself just kind of write about other things and learn my writer's chops, when I did come back to it, there were painful things. I think, you know, anytime you're, you're writing memoir, um, you're excavating your past, and there are things in our past that are always painful. But there was also something wonderfully cathartic about it. You know, like it wasn't just, oh, oh, I have to relive a lot of things that are painful for me. It was, I can make more sense of what happened to me in this kind of hindsight. I can understand my own experience because I'm working it out on the page and I'm discovering things about it now that I wouldn't have been able to see in, in the moment. And I can also understand that these things change us, and it's not necessarily what life throws at us, but what we do with what life throws at us that it is meaning-making and that can give shape and voice to our experiences. And so a lot of the essays 
um, that where I start to talk about illness, I, I think that it was part of the healing process for me. And, um, you know, I grew more accepting of where I was now as I was writing those essays. And uh, particularly um, the ones around uh, having to have a total knee replacement at age 36. I mean, this is a, a surgery that is mostly for people in their 60s or above. <laughs> and, yeah. Um, you know, it was it was tough um, to come to that point where I was like, I mean, I have to do this or I'm not going to be able to get around anymore. Uh, it also freaked me up to teach more dance and other things. But I really do think that writing about it allowed me to, to really just discover things about myself um, and about what this meant for me um, that were, they were painful, but they weren't painful, just painful. They were also, they led to a greater sense of healing. And, you know, I would encourage anyone, whether you're going to publish it or if it's just for yourself, if you're going through something, try writing about it because you might discover things uh, in doing that, that, that help you deal with it and that makes sense out of a situation that doesn't always feel like it makes sense. And is this what you taught, what you refer to as narrative medicine? It is. Um, and, you know, narrative medicine is actually a practice that comes out of um, Columbia University. There's an amazing woman, uh, Dr. Rita Sharon, who is both a general internist so she's an MD and a literary scholar. She has a PhD in literature uh, with a focus on uh, the author Henry James. And what she realized was when she was finishing her PhD that the kind of things that they talk about when we talk about stories were things that were influencing the work in her clinic. And so um, she started to really investigate this, and I started to um, become really aware of this because I had been asked, um, ironically, by the director of dance here at WVU, um, if I would talk to a friend of his who was a palliative care physician. And at the time, I didn't know what palliative care was, so I had to Google it. And... Um, he was helping a man who had ALS, and one of the things that, that palliatives do, um, you know, especially when they're working with um, folks that have terminal illnesses, is they try to figure out, um, you know, goals and legacy making uh, for those folks. And this man said, I want to write my memoir before I die. Mm. <laughs> Fear was he done. So this palliative care physician was asking everyone he knew, do you know a writer that could, could help? And so the director of dance was his kids uh, were in school together, reached out to me and said, will you take his call? <laughs> <laughs> ended up helping um, this patient, a man named Jamie Shumway, write his memoir um, and I said, look, I don't know what I'm doing <laughs> because I've written my own stuff, but I've never written with somebody else. And, um, you know, I'm good, but, you know, this touches me and I want to see if I can help you. And so I started looking for guides and uh, Rita Sharon had written a book called Narrative Medicine, Honoring the Stories of Illness. So I'm reading this, trying to figure out, you know, <laughs> what I've embarked on and they had a workshop at Columbia and I said, I got to get to this workshop. Um, so I went there and I realized that's what I had been doing with myself. Um, and then started to understand how helping people write their life stories, you know, helps them when they're going through um, significant events and, and those significant events are often around illness. Um, it, I worked with about 70, a little over 70 patients um, that were receiving chemotherapy at, at WV Medicine's uh, Cancer Institute uh, several years ago. Um, and that was a really moving experience for me. And I felt very, very connected 
with those patients. I also did a story project with uh, patients with HIV, WVU medicine. Um, and so what I, what I realized was, okay, I could do this for myself, but I could also use, you know, the talents that I had in service to helping other people through their illnesses. Um, because it, I think when you become a patient, it's really easy to fall into the role of the patient and forget that you're still a lot of other things. I mean, we have all sorts of different roles we play as people, right? Right. Um, the moment you're diagnosed, right, you fall into that role of patient, and so much of that feels beyond you. Um, and luckily, um, I was able to collaborate with some doctors that realized that knowing a patient's story could help them in the clinic. Um, that was also something that really, that really spoke to me, and I'm super grateful. Um, there's a core group of doctors at, at WVU Medicine that share this um, interest in, and um, really in the sense of honoring patients through their stories. Um, and I've been really fortunate to get to work with those folks uh, ongoing. Um, and I'm really excited to say there's um, so much enthusiasm for narrative medicine at our health science center. Um, and, and that, you know, to me feels like a legacy. It's, it's both types of the book, but it's really, you know, part of, you know, maybe a bigger sense of what I'm doing here. Oh, um, that's, or, that's amazing. That's really, yeah, the, it can help, writing can help the patient, but I never thought about it being able to help the people caring for the patient as well. Sure. And, you know, doctors, nurses, for sure, but also family members um, who often, you know, don't feel included in the discussion. Um, I've had many family members from the folks that I worked with um, they really perish the stories. Not everybody has a written account of someone they love. Um, mm. And have that uh, thing, I, there was a man that I worked with, and um, he was a quiet, uh, a rather stoic individual. And I, I was worried about his story because I was like, oh, there's not going to be here, and I hope I'm, you know, <laughs> helping and all that. And, and so I, I brought him his story. He was very pleased with it. And then I ran into his wife um, when I was either coming or going from the clinic. And she said, you know, all of our kids wrote, wrote this and they, they read this and they all felt they had learned something about their father. <laughs> from reading it. And I was so touched by that. And I, you know, so, you know, what what I might think is forthcoming and what somebody else might think is, is different, but it really taught me, like, yeah, there's there's a lot of power in just putting things down on paper. Um, well, and, Renee, before we run out of time, I'd like you to read from Fierce and Delicate. Oh, I would love to do that. And um, I'm just going to read uh, a little bit from uh, the title essay, which is Fierce and Delicate. The girls file in and face the bar. We begin with a warm-up, demi-point, full-point, demi-point flat. Hondi turn in, turn out, and close. The girls feel their way into their bodies, and I watch. Sometimes a student needs guiding into her dancer's posture. I notice Kira wears a new leotard, and Megan has piled her long blonde hair high on her head, a bow fastened against it at a jaunty angle. In the class before hers, another blonde, younger, emulates Megan's look with a bow of her own, the neat bun taught to her by the girl she admires. Remember the, the allure of these older students, the allure of a future filled with peachy pink satin shoes and newly sewn ribbons. One of the joys of being a ballet teacher is the moment when a student learns to rise on point, when a ballet's rites of passage, the change from a little girl's dancing to the work of becoming a ballerina. We begin point work with two hands on the bar, learning to dance correctly sur la plan, 
is one of the most important aspects of a young dancer's training. There can be no shortcuts. It's slow in the work. Each dancer's eyes are wide and twinkling as she adjusts her body to hold herself up on her shoes for the first time. There's nothing quite like the feeling of the full length of the leg while balancing on point. She is taller, statelier, maybe even more beautiful than just a moment before. Later will come blisters from two hard shoes or two soft ones, from overwork and not enough care. There will be foot baths with Epsom salts, hundreds of band-aids for heels and toes. The feet will cramp and ache. Shoes will cost a small fortune and never last long enough, but that is later. For now, there is a sense of light, a sense of accomplishment, a sense that the future brings more dancing, balancing in retiré or arabesque, like the pictures in ballet books or New York City ballet mailers. In point class, Kara works to hold her turnout as she balances in first position and slowly lowers her body. She presses her inner thighs as if the insides of her legs are being glued together. When she starts to feel it, when it starts to look correct, her shy smile betrays the pleasure of accomplishment. And that was Renee Nicholson reading from Fierce and Delicate Essays on Dance and Illness. So this essay goes on to talk about um, saying when someone thinks of classical ballet, it's probably not West Virginia that comes to mind. What took you to Morgantown, West Virginia? So um, my family... Um, on my father's side goes back in West Virginia, you know, generations. I, I think as many generations as before the state of West Virginia was actually a state. <laughs> and um, my my father grew up in Parkersburg, West Virginia, and uh, went to West Virginia University. And my mom moved to Parkersburg. They're high school sweethearts. Um, and uh, my dad went to WVU. He's a diehard Mountaineer fan. And when I was studying creative writing, um, he got the alumni uh, magazine, and there was a writer's workshop on campus. <laughs> and well, I love West Virginia, and you love writing, so I'm going to send you to this. Aww. <laughs> so. I went to the workshop, and this was um, mid mid nineties, um, you know, mid late nineties. And I kept going. Like I went that one summer, and then I saved up, and I went the next summer. And so I kept going, and and um, you know, I was working, and I would take, you know, this was my vacation, and <laughs> I'd go to this writers' workshop. And from this writers' workshop, they started an MFA program. And one summer, I was working with a lovely writer. His name is Peter McCook. He's a short story writer um, and just a fabulous human being, was always giving me great books to read. And he said, you know, have you ever considered an MFA program? And I said, I don't, I don't know. I don't know that I'm MFA material. And another good friend of mine, um, a poet named John Hoppenthaler, said, have you ever thought about an MFA program? <laughs> and so <laughs> I said, well, you know, WVU has this MFA program, and I've gotten to know a couple of the, you know, professors there, and there was this wonderful professor here. Her name was Gail Adams, and she had a dance background, and so I thought, well, I'll apply, and, and if I don't get in there, maybe I won't, you know, I'll pick a different way, or maybe I'll try applying again and, and look at other programs while um accepted to the program. <laughs> so, <laughs> I came to Morgan, and it was not necessarily my um, ambition to stay. You know, I was excited to be in West Virginia. I still have family in Clarksburg and Parkersburg and all, you know, all, all around. And um, so it was nice, you know, in that way. Um, and I thought, you know, I'll, I'll be here for the pro program, and we'll see what happens. Well, um, you know, I came here uh, I, and I was married. My husband's an accountant and he got a job, uh, you know, here in town. As it turns out, 
unlike ballet dancers and writers, accounting work um, is needed everywhere. So if you're a CPA, <laughs> your chances of finding gainful employment almost anywhere are pretty high. Um, and so he found a, a good job and, and had some people he really liked working with. So when I graduated, it didn't really make sense for us to move away <laughs> because, you know, he was the one, uh, you know, who was kind of set. So, um, and, and then... Uh, I had my knee surgery here, and then I started teaching dance, and so, and it was, and then, and then, and then. <laughs> and then you lived happily ever after. <laughs> right, and now it's been 16 years. I've actually lived in Morgantown longer than any other place in my life. Wow. My my dad moved away for work, and I moved back for work. <laughs> <laughs> So, Renee, in the few minutes we have left, why don't we talk a little bit about your writing process? So, how, when you're starting an essay, how does it begin? Sometimes it begins with a snippet of music. Sometimes it begins with, like, something I can't get out of my head, usually an image. Um, Every once in a while, I'll just be thinking on something for a while, so I'll, I'll start to, you know, kind of journal doodle it uh, you know I don't draw necessarily doodle but word doodle um, and you know I'm I'm a pretty um, you know every day I try to write a little bit even if it's you know not a lot uh, some days that'll go further but I feel it, it's kind of like the dancer has class every day to keep the the muscles you know (laughs) knowing it's muscle memory so um and sometimes these things you know will you know stick with me and i can't really knock them out of my head then i'm like that's probably the beginning of something um but i do try to write pretty regularly and um you know uh when i was writing fierce and delicate i listened a lot to the music of, of dance which is really um, there's so many beautiful scores, and especially all the Tchaikovsky. I feel like uh, I have uh, an intimate relationship with, uh, you know, Sleeping Beauty and Swan Lake, mm. uh, particularly. <laughs> that music just uh, really, st- uh, you know, uh, stays with me. But really all the music um, from all the ballets, um, you know, I would be listening to this. Uh, quite a bit when I was was writing that book. Um, now I've been working on some essays that venture away from dance, but it's still a lot of music uh, really does stay with me. Um, The dancer Tony Bentley uh, wrote this slim memoir called uh, Winter Season, which is a beautiful book. And in it, she she said, and I don't know if this is, if I'm remembering it perfectly, but she said, she wrote, dancers eat music. (laughs) And that always, (laughs) like, I'm so true. So um, for me, that that definitely plays a role. But, you know, I too try to be mindful to try to hit the page every day because I feel like, you know, that's my exercise. And from that, you know, a lot of it will get discarded. Uh, But every once in a while, I'm like, no, this is the thing. And it's usually an image or a sentence or something like that that just, it keeps working on me. And um, I handwrite all my early drafts. Um, my students would say, oh, that's so old-fashioned. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love the feel of writing. Um, I, I like how a pen feels against paper. And, and so those early drafts are these big, messy, handwritten, scrawling things. Um, and then, you know, as I, if I think something's kind of got legs, I start typing it into usually Word or, you know, some word processing and some editing starts to happen. And then somewhere in there, you know, it, it, you know, I'll say this, this feels like it's going to go somewhere or this is kind of abandoned. I have, you know, a, a file of just abandoned. <laughs> Sometimes I will come back to them, but, um, you know, and then the inevitable, okay, I've, I've made an electronic version, so what do I do? I print it out so I can handwrite all of it. Well, Renee, I'd love to talk more about that, but we're actually out of time. And I just want to say that I really enjoyed this book. It, it really touched me in, um, I don't know, sort of um, kind of a melancholy but also a joyful way. And we always close with a quote. And I found a quote 
about ballet that I think is very apropos for this. It's from Merce Cunningham. It says, you have to love dancing to stick to it. It gives you nothing back. No manuscripts to store away, no paintings to show on walls, no poems to be printed, nothing but that single fleeting moment when you feel alive. What a beautiful quote, and thank you so much um, for your care with the book and for our discussion today. Well, thank you, Renee, and see you all next week on Writer's Voices. Mm-hmm.